Welcome everyone once again to Dominus S. To those of you who are tuning in just today, Dominus S is a good news, good vibes website that was launched in October last year by His Eminence Cardinal Tagle. And we have with us today our founding priest, Father Jason Laguerta, who is also the director for the Office of the Promotion of New Evangelization, as well as the parish priest of Sacred Heart in Old Santa Mesa. And I am Margo Salcedo, the editor-in-chief of Dominus S. For our first season of In-Depth, we have been focusing on the first missions in the Philippines in line with the celebration of 500 years of Christianity. And today we have with us no less than the prior provincial of the Order of Augustinian Recollects. And we have the honor today to introduce Father Jonisio Selma, prior provincial. Hello, Father. Welcome po to Dominus S. Hello, Welcome, Father. Jason. So to our audience, if I may have the honor of introducing Father Janisha Selma this morning. Um, he uh, actually started um, his spiritual formation uh, at the Casisiaco. Um, he studied philosophy and also has, had his novitiate in Baguio. Um, but later on, he proceeded to Spain where he studied theology at the Colegio Internacional de los Agustinos Recoletos, uh, which is also affiliated with the University of Navarra. Is that correct, Father? Before proceeding to, he went all over Europe, before proceeding to Rome for his licentiate in dogmatic theology at the Pontifical Gregorian University. And so today, we, we, he is, since 2015, he has been the prior provincial of the Order of Augustinian Recollects. And he will enlighten us today on St. Augustine, as well as the Order of the Augustinian Recollects and how they arrived in the Philippines. So welcome, Father, to In Depth. We're so excited to learn from you. Yeah. Salamat again uh, for this Actually, opportunity. Uh, Yes, Father. A few weeks ago, uh, we had with us, or was it just last week, we had with us um, the OSA. Uh, we had um, Father Peter Casino, who is the regional, um, uh, regional vicar of the OSA. And he also spoke to us about St. Augustine. But he told us that there is an Augustinian family. And um, so we're very excited to learn about St. Augustine today from the perspective of the Recollects. Um, maybe you could enlighten us for about um, the difference between the OSA and the OAR and the affiliation po of um, or how the Recollects uh, continue to be inspired by St. Augustine. Yeah, practically, I perhaps you have very, very many stories, historical uh, narrations about the Augustinian family. Practically, the Augustinian family did not start officially uh, as a group from St. Augustine, but it is a, uh, a mi mixture of hermits in Toscana, Italy, wherein they followed the rule of St. Augustine because after the Vandals, uh, St. Augustine's disciples were together with him, they were scattered. And I think you have heard that from F Father Peter. So all these different communities, Giliarmites, headed by, uh, uh, by one, one charismatic leader following the Rome of and other hermits. And they were grouped called by the Vatican, Alexander IV, also then the 1256, 1256, the Grand Union, we call it the Grand Union. Those who followed the rule of St. Augustine became of an Augustinian family. And from there, uh, the, the Augustinian family, therefore, has, as, as being stated there, there is the spiritual father or uh, father St. Augustine because we base our, our charism from his life, from his doctrine, from his rule. And that family continued until those hermits who did not join, did not be, belong to the Egyptian family. Then later on, the Recollects came out as a reform movement of the Augustinians, the OSA. So 1588, influenced by the, I think, that the, the movement of that time, in St. Teresa, the Carmelite, and St. John, the cross, etc. So the, the reform, there was a the reform movement of, of the Augustinian family. 
And there were groups of Agustinian from the province of Castile in Toledo, Spain. Uh, there was that, that uh, inspiration from the Holy Spirit during that provincial chapter. And that def the definitions or provisions or decisions, ordinance in that provincial chapter, that a group of um, men, Agustinians, uh, would like to live a stricter kind of life as a, in community, focusing on interior interiority, more contemplation, etc., without the idea of really separating from the Agustinians. So there were still Agustinians in the beginning. But again, we know that we do not know how the Holy Spirit worked until. In 1912, no, uh, can you imagine, 1586, uh, we arrived here, but it started 1588, that movement, a group of Augustinians. Then, 1606, they came here in the Philippines. So, as part of the Augustinian family still, but we practically through uh, the, the 1912 by Pope Pius X, we were able, the religious as familias, we, we were told to become an order with our own prior general, with our constitution, etc. And that's the official, he would say, uh, separation from the OSA. You know? But without really having a lot of differences, especially following the same rule, following the same doctrine of St. Augustine, and con continuing to live that charism of St. Augustine. Yeah. And I, I think, think Father... Have... Okay. Father... Father Jason Po, I think, would be very interested in the fact that the document of foundation, as Father Janisha mentioned, it was in 1588, but Father Jason would be interested in the fact that the document of the foundation was signed on December 5, 1588, Ooh. which is Father Jason's <laughs> birthday. So, magka birthday po kayo. Ako, ako, eh? Eh? Oh, very good. Yeah. Father, That's I'm same, interested that... also in the, the word recollect. What, what does it mean really po, yung, uh, when you say recoleto or recollect? Okay, practically, re, no, in Latin, back, collect. So, re, going back to oneself. So, to recollect interiority, that's the focus of St. Augustine, to recollect, to go to oneself. Nole for us ire, do not go out of yourself, uh, enter into yourself. Well, we know very well that we can find God there. So recollect, that's the, more or less the etymology of the recollectos. Recollect. So, going back to oneself. Father, let's talk about St. Augustine naman for a while. Um, okay. Which is your favorite since uh, we have with us a, 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 an authority on dogmatic theology? <laughs> I'll take advantage po. Father, which is, your, which is the work of St. Augustine that is your favorite? I'm, I super love the Confessions. The Book of Confessions, th these are the great works of St. Augustine, Book of Confessions, The City of God. You know, these are the main uh, texts that would interest the people because the first part of the Book of Confession, that was a serial story, confession would mean confession of God's love, mercy, not only the sins because it was then the second part night because confession is a process, no? So not just a personal conversion but really confessing who God is in his life, how he, how God draw him from darkness. And later on, if you notice, the, the names are not mentioned, only later part of that book, no, St. Augustine. Pero I, in, in his sermons, he has so many sermons that even the Vatican II had to uh, scrap some of them according to the lineamental the studies of the groups. Uh, otherwise, it will be full, uh, filled with Augustinian doctrines. So that is how rich St. Augustine is. And uh, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth doctoral studies is about St. Augustine. And again, the, the Deus Caritas Est of these encyclicals of, of uh, Pope Benedict Meritos and also the special way, the first two are practically based and inspired by St. Augustine. And he admitted that one, that it is based on the uh, doctrine of St. Augustine. That's why he loves St. Augustine so much. So St. Augustine is practically is even the greatest theologian and philosopher at the same time. Uh, not, not comparing with others, but as many authors would say, and even theologians, he is the greatest among the, the doctors. Oh. In relation to that, I would like to share that in his sermon, uh, in his, in his uh, commentaries on St. John, uh, he has good things about it is the Lord, Dominus Est. No? He, he was even saying that uh, Dominus Est is uh, 
said by St. John, the beloved disciple of Jesus, uh, while they were uh, fishing at the Tiberias, the lake in Tiberias, no? it is the Lord whom they see walking. No? Because they were fishing all night long and they did not catch anything. And when the Lord no, was telling them, oh, did you catch something? No? So cast the net, etc. Then they said, it is the Lord. Then St. Augustine continues, and that Dominus S should not only be limited to that Lake Tiberias, because according to him, foolish is the man who only sees God with the body, namely the eyes of the body, but rather uh, he should, because God can be seen with the eyes of the heart. And with the eyes of the heart, therefore God Dominus S can be found in many aspects. So he mentioned not only that the Tiberias, in St. Augustine, in two or three sermons, he said, Dominus S can be found in the needy, in the poor, it is the Lord. And he distinguishes between rich and poor, Jesus. Jesus as man is poor. Jesus as God is rich. And this Jesus, God, is already in heaven. And this Jesus, poor man, is also in heaven. But he continues to be poor because he is still here there because of the poor. There are still many who are poor, naked, hungry. And it is there, it is the Lord. And St. Augustine would say to his, to his parishioners, to his faithful and to his companions in the monastery, take care of the, uh, be merciful to the poor, to the needy, because it is the Lord, Dominus Est, in them. So take care of them. So it, Dominus Est, Jesus, the Lord is in them. And said, he continues, that Dominus Est can still be in the pain, in suffering, in death. Dominus Est, it is the Lord in our pain, in our suffering. That's why he prunes. And the one who he prunes, uh, the fruitful does not mean those who are suffering, uh, they are, we, we are sinners, he said. Uh, he prunes the fruitful branch in order to be more fruitful. And it is the Lord who prunes. So in this pain, in the suffering, and even in death, it is the Lord there. And he continues another, that it is the Lord in the Eucharist, which is not only a symbol, but in the species. It is the Lord who is in the Eucharist. And finally, he said, it is the Lord in the church praying. So therefore, as a whole body, because the church is the body of Christ and it is not separated from the head and he is the head. So when the church prays the liturgy, it is Christ praying for us, in us, with us, and for us. And we pray to Jesus by us. So there's it is the Lord praying for us. No dominus as it is the Lord. No, with us. So that is how St. Augustine developed that, that aspect of it is the Lord of John 21 7. No? So that is how. Assignment, uh, Margo, assignment, you read those sermons of St. Augustine. Oh, with pleasure. I'm, <laughs> yeah. I, I have to research that. Yes, yeah. oh my gosh. Father Jason, why don't we not know that? Oh, thank but, you so much Father, for enlightening us, yeah, yeah. Father. Father, how about the title of Doctor of Grace? Paano po na-ascribe kay St. Augustine yung uh, yeah. Doctor of Grace? Yeah, because uh, because of Pelagius, you know, during his time, the, the Pelagianism, they were so proud that that, I, that ideology uh, uh, of course, advocated by Pelagius, who said that man can and do everything through his own effort. And therefore, St. Augustine would say, no, even the, the start of inspiration within a person is still the work of grace. And because everything is grace. And nobody can say that the, Jesus is Lord if, that, if not by the Holy Spirit. So it is, again, by grace that we can think, we can work, etc., so not even our own efforts, the, the inspiration from, from what the, we receive as gifts uh, in our uh, constitution, but the constitution, we are nothing. No, I am the true bond, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So again, it is the, the Lord. No, that's why he's called the doctor of grace. No? He also had a work on the Trinity, Father. Could you enlighten us on, on that? And that was also groundbreaking. With uh, many says that that is one of the the work of Saint Augustine, which is very tense, no, and tense and dense, dense, you would say. And in fact, he died without finishing because in, in reality, the the Trinity is the first category mystery, no, mysterium stricti dictum, as we would say in theology. 
strictly speaking. So St. Augustine would just like to introduce his own idea and explaining that one because there are many ways of explaining the Trinity, you know, cosmological, psychological. St. Augustine would use the memory, the intellect, memory, understanding, has, having only one mind, the same person, you no? Know? so in Trinity. So in that, that book, the Trinitate, he, he, he shares his own uh, illustration of what is Trinity. Because others would fall into modalism. Modalism would say the Father is only a mode, uh, or uh, the Son is only a mode of the Father becoming man, and the Holy Spirit, so modalism, manner of becoming a uh, person. In short, the, the Holy Trinity in St. Augustine is also an illustration of his own reflection of the Trinity. It's a, a help in order to understand better that mystery, but not really. Uh, understand totally. Otherwise, it is not a mystery anymore. Father, let's go po to um, the Philippines. Um, what okay. do you think? What do you think are the highlights? Uh, if you, if we could summarize the legacy of the Augustinian Recollects for the first missions, um, what do you think would this would this be? Uh, well, since you're asking that one, I don't like to brag, no, because it is the Lord has, has, has to be glorified. So anyway, so the the spirituality, the Christianity is being uh, started by us through our first uh, fathers, missionaries, uh, bringing the uh, the Nazareno, no, the first image of Mount Carmel. That's why the devotion, the scapular, we we introduced that one. Then we have the uh, and the other aspects, the a bamboo organ of Las Piñas by Father Diego Serra. We have the Basilica of San Sebastian. We have the uh, Balon Pari of Palawan by San Ezequiel Moreno. Uh, then, of course, San Ezequiel Moreno who was with us for 15 years. No, he was ordained priest here and became bishop in Colombia and he became saint. No? So those are mga kwan. Then the, the hydrotherapy in Negros, the sugar industry was introduced, all these things were we'll being introduced by our fathers. Then this Christianity in many provinces, in Mindanao and in Visayas and Negros and Bohol. We just celebrated the 250 years presence in, in Bohol and we are proud because there are so many Bolano bishops. So at least you are part of that uh, area uh, aspect. Uh, there are many Boholanos who uh, became bishops and uh, the, the, the evangelization area can be seen in the people. So last year, we, we toured around because the Jesuits, when the Jesuits were expelled, uh, they called us to resume, to assume the, the, this apostolate and also in many parts of Mindanao. So we had a lot of years of, of working with them, but we are always silent. We do not want to find that one. Uh, so we toured all, all those small parishes, even the cathedrals, the Talibon and the, the Tagbilaran, and in the different parishes where we were in. No, Hagna, no, the, the, the Indulman, all those mga Loon, and the churches that were hit by the earthquake. No, many of those many good churches were built by the recollects. And even uh, up to now, sa Sambales and other areas. No? So and then very interesting, yeah. Father, because so actually when the Augustinian recollects arrived in 1606, at the time you weren't yet an order. Yes, as a congregation, but Just having already our having already the vicar general, practically our own superior, but still uh, connected with the the Agustian family as a whole. Nowadays, for where can you find the recollects for? Where do you find the recollect missions? Uh, are in the world. When we are into more than twenty countries, but the province of Sinaloa, Morena, which is the Philippine province, we are into. Taiwan, uh, Indonesia, um, Sierra Leone, Saipan, and many parts of the Philippines. But the, the recollects as a whole, the, we are into Latin America, practically Brazil, Guatemala, Panama, Mexico, Colombia, no? uh, Nicaragua, uh, no? Panama, that area, there, Mexico, so Colombia, then uh, Estados Unidos. These are practically our mission. And many of our bishops come from the mission area territories. So, Father, as prior provincial, you also extend all the way to Guam and Sierra Leone? Yes. Not just the Philippines. Wow. 
do you have to travel the, there there now how do you how do you do that you can't now travel yeah, because our constitutions would require the major superior in this case the provincial to visit during his term at least once he can visit of course many times no but officially we call that the official visit paternal visit to visit all the communities where the the houses of the province has uh, therefore i have to visit uh the these communities in, in Sierra Leone in Taiwan and in, in in Saipan in in Indonesia etc to see our brothers how are they in their mission and how are they as a community and then um, i think it's very interesting for that when the recollects arrived in the philippines there were only 14 of them but throughout those um the first three centuries maybe until 1898 uh umabot po ng more than 1,000 recollects, all scattered all over the country. Many priests of ours were really fighting, we would say, violently against the Muslims. No, Padre Capitan, that's why he was uh, having the title Padre Capitan, because he built a lot of fortresses, especially in Mindanao, in order for the Moros, the Muslim, not to penetrate and Christianity will be defended. Many of our mission, missionaries, early missionaries died defending our faith. Even in Mindoro, in Sambales, this area there, uh, the first recollects were sent there because we were the fifth um, order uh, who came to the Philippines. And therefore, the, the good areas, you know, they were already uh, uh, populated by the Gostinians, the Dominicans, the Jesuits, the Franciscans, etc. And we were thrown and we were given the far away places, more provinces. And our first, we would say, martyrs, because they were uh, killed by the natives, they, they, they work and they were there. And that is how we, we started. I was yeah. reading about Archbishop Jose Arangure, who was Archbishop right. of Manila for a time. He was recollect yeah. father. Yes, the only recollect Augustinian in, bishop in Manila, Arangure. And he invited the Sisters of Charity, although they arrived after he passed away. He was the one who yeah. brought them in, Po. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting another, story, Po. Yes, Father. We have another recollect bishop who died here, Bishop Espiga, the one in Palawan. He is buried there. Bishop Espiga, yes. He was the apostolic vicar of Palawan. Is that correct, Po? He was called yes. the Guerrilla Padre. Because he always risked his life crossing Japanese lines in order to administer the sacraments to war refugees. That's in terms it. of the relationship ng uh, Augustinian Recollect Sisters with the OAR, paano po yan? Anong, how, how did it go? Yung, uh, we have Augustinian Recollect Sisters also. Uh, okay. So practically, the Augustinian Recollect Sisters, the, marami po sila yan. Pero sa Agustinian Recollect Sisters in the Philippines, it was inspired and practically founded by an Agustinian Recollect priest, uh, Father Rodrigo San Agustin, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, he was the prior of San Sebastian. So the, the foundresses of the Agustinian Recollect Sisters, the Talampa Sisters, Cecilia Rosa and Dionysia, they were from Bulacan, Calumpet, Bulacan. And they started as parang biyakas. No, they were, so devotees to Mount Carmel. Since the Recollectors, Recollectors are known as the one who bring the image of the Nazareno in the Philippines. So the, the Talangpa sisters were so devoted to that and they took care of the, the Carmel up to now. They are in charge of that. And with that, they, they asked the friars in San Sebastian that they will be admitted uh, to their spirituality. So they started as abiatas and they were given the mantilata, the bello, etc. Until, of course, there was a, an initial conflict. You know, then the work of the Holy Spirit again moved to be, uh, for them to become a congregation. Who was the patron, saint, or um, patroness of the recollects? Practically, I mean, of, of course, are, it's St. Augustine, but Our Lady? Practically, the whole order uh, honors the Blessed Mother, you know, but with a special title just like any other religious congregation, because as a church, we are all members of the same mother, uh, hospital mother, Blessed Virgin Mary. So the Recoletos has the uh, Our Lady of Consolation, the patroness of the whole order, while the Augustinians, you have the Nuestra Señora Belbuen Consejo, good counsel. 
for us at Our Lady of Consolation, wherein uh, the Virgin Mary appeared to St. Augustine and St. Monica with the child Jesus having the sanctuary. Kaya nga, the title is Our Lady of St. Chore also. How can we, uh, in a way, uh, continue the mission and at the same time reform whatever is needed to be to be reformed? It's always say, nice to be hearing our forefathers of uh, these things. But the question is, they are, they are received and they were received very good by people, the arrival. But the um, question is, how, how are the recollects? No? Continuing that, the new evangelization. We are saying that many leaders in the government are coming from uh, Catholic schools. We have also you know, two universities here in, in, in the Philippines, University of San Jose de Cebu, University of Negros Occidental in Bacolod. And we have three San, San, San Sebastian colleges, etc. Pero uh, Ateneo, La Salle, UST, practically the leaders are Catholics. Pero why, how, why, why is it that we are one of the corrupt? countries. So after 500 years of evangelization of Christianity, how is it now? So that is a question that has also to be, challenged, uh, to be thrown to our province and to our order. No? How is it being you know, translated to our time? Maybe po, as a last question, you could inspire us. Uh, how do we continue in the footsteps of the Lord? How do we continue in the footsteps of St. Augustine? Um, looking forward to the next 500 years, how do we pass this on to this generation and to the next? So I think that uh, we should again go back to ourselves, St. Augustine, interiority, in Noli for us, Ire, transcend the Epsom, transcend yourself, then go back to yourself, and there you find the truth, God Himself, and there you transcend that. Uh, therefore, the life that we have here is just passing and knowing that uh, we have a mission, uh, that same mission from the Lord, it has to be continued, and therefore uh, we should also be challenged to rekindle, rekindle, rekindle that 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 uh, life, that that uh, inspiration that they were doing. At the same time, the, to really do it with more passion and more intense um, that than they did in our time then to be also updated with what is to be uh, what is to be used as instruments for evangelization no new ways new methods new terms new new approaches uh, even though seemingly the old uh, friars the old religious will not entertain but still we have to do that so again intensify uh, living with with full intensity with passion and would saint augustine would say following always the advice of the Lord, he always reminds us, you no? Know, uh, remember that people will be attracted to you by the way you, they see you, your love for one another in the community. That's why St. Augustine will insist, you no? Know, uh, first, uh, humility. Second, humility. Third, humility. But do that always as a community. And as a community of believers and as, as called by the Lord, we become one soul. So we are, uh, St. Augustine would say that we are uh, concerned for one another. And that's the time we can really work together with one mind, one heart upon God. And that's the time we can attract people. Beautiful. Father Jason, do you nothing have a response to, to that? Nothing, <laughs> nothing more. <laughs> so I'm very grateful to the Augustinians and, of course, to St. Augustine. Very inspirational for all of us. And uh, thank you, Father, uh, the Augustinian family, and uh, recollects uh, on behalf of the church, talaga, no? on behalf of all the, you know, all the Catholics that have been uh, formed by the Augustinians. Uh, I think their training and formation under your care would, would of course, uh, be fruitful in the end. Baka ngayon lang siguro hindi natin nakikita yung fruits, but I know somewhere, some you know, in some other, sometime, uh, the fruits of our labor would also be uh, be seen no? in our uh, students and parishioners. Thank you very much, Father uh, Selma. Thank you, Selma, for you so much, you. Thank you so much Father. Yes, thank you for sharing your wisdom and for sharing with us the wisdom of St. Augustine. Okay, okay, and we'll be back.
again, everyone. Um, I'm Margot Salcedo, Editor-in-Chief of Dominus S. And we have the honor today of having with us a historian, a church historian who can really tell us all about the 500 years of Christianity. Um, I will introduce, I have the honor of introducing Father Emilio Edgardo Quilatan of the Order of Augustinian Recollects. Father Quilatan is from Cavite City. And it's extra special because his birthday is this September, September 11. Happy birthday, Father. Let us Happy be birthday in advance, Father. Thank you. Another year, uh, another blessing, another lease of life from the Lord. He professed the religious vows as an Augustinian recollect in 1986 and then pursued theology uh, in 1991 at the Recoletos Formation Center in Quezon City. So he was ordained a priest uh, in 1992 um, before being assigned to the Augustinian Reculet community of the San Sebastian Friary in Quiapo, Manila. And then he became assistant parish priest of the architectural wonder that is the San Sebastian Basilica. And then in 1994, he was sent to Rome, where he studied at the Pontifical Gregorian University. And that is where he obtained his licentiate. That's a master's degree, po, di ba? Yes. His, li his licentiate in church history. So if we really need to know anything about church history, it's really Father Kilatan. Uh, and uh, his doctorate in church history. Oh my goodness, Father. And he graduated both Magna Cum Laude. Oh, see, si Father Jason Paul is also a doctor. Uh, Magna Cum Laude ka, baka Zoom Cum Laude ka, Father, ha? <laughs> zoom lang. Zoom Laude. <laughs> zoom. Zoom Laude. And um, his doctoral dissertation was the Friar Hacienda Controversy in the Philippines at the turn of the 20th century. Facts and fiction. He also served as dean of the Recoleto School of Theology from 2009 to 2018. Kaya po pala kayo close ni Father Rico, who is also Dean in San Carlos. Yeah. We were also contemporaries in Rome. He was also in Rome when we met. Oh, so we wow. Iba talaga ang bonding pag, tala mag pag nasa abroad pa magkasama, di ba? And currently, Father Kilatan is the archive administrator of the Archivo Recoleto in Buluagang Recoletos. And now also teaching church history. How can I become your student, Father? <laughs> At the <Enroll>. Recoletos <laughs> School Enroll. of Theology. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have the great honor today of having with us Father Emil Kilatan. Hello, Father. Hello, 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 brothers and sisters. Welcome, welcome Father. Thank you, Father. Father. Thank you. Father, let's go back to when the Recollects arrived in the Philippines. So, where did they first land? Well, they first landed in Cebu. From Guam, they have to rest in Cebu. And from Cebu, they proceeded to Manila. They arrived late of, uh, early of June or late of May. And they stayed first with the Dominicans. And from the Dominican convent of Santo Domingo, they transferred to San Agustin. And later, out of begging, they begged. They were able to buy a house and lot outside of Intramuros in Bagumbay, which is now Luneta, no? and had their first community there. And in that same year, they accepted their first mission in Zambales and part of Bataan. That was in 1606 and established their first mission in no, Masinlok, Zambales in 1607. Okay, so the, our first mission was Zambales and south of Bataan from Maribeles going north no, to Zambales. No? And we have to travel by sea. That, that time, wala pang ano. Wala pang SC, wala pang tayong ano, ika nga North Expressway. <laughs> or ano, yung, ika nga eh, yung mga highway na yun, no They have to travel by sea and inland no? with difficulties. Father, so, we'll, take, we'll take advantage of your being a, an amazing church historian. And baka po we, we could be enlightened on the divisions. Uh, apparently, di ba po, there were certain provinces that were assigned to certain orders. Mm -hmm. um, baka po you could enlighten us on who yes. got okay. which and how? 
1594, Philip II gave an order to the governor general that time, no? I think it was Francisco Tello, to subdivide the islands among religious orders. Wala pa kami, that's 1594. Because remember, we arrived 1606. So the Augustinians, the Franciscans, the Jews, and the Dominicans were distributed, no? Uh, uh, where they should evangelize. For some reasons, number one, to avoid jurisdictional conflicts. Second, no, important to, to initiate, to, the, uh, to continue the systematic evangelization of our, of our ancestors. And third, what is more important, they could learn two or more languages of the natives where they will be assigned. That, that's, that's the reason why Philip II ordered the subdivision of the archipelago among the religious orders in 1594. So, madami yan, no? For example, the Agustinians, no? Saan sila nagsimula? The province of Tondo, which is now Tondo, no? Manila, no? From Malate, Tondo proper, hanggang sa Lawag, no? No, northern, no, no. Uh, northern, uh, Ilocos Norte. The Dominicans, saan sila nagsimula? Part of Bataan, going up to some to ano to Pangasinan, hanggang sa Babuyanes, etc. No, the Franciscans from Quezon Province up to what is now Bicol, the Jesuits, Antipolo, Samar, Leyte, no, uh, western part of Mindanao, no, Marinduque, no. So that, these were allotted to them. So as I said, to avoid conflicts, to have the systematized evangelization, systematic evangelization of the, of the natives, and third, to learn two or more languages of the natives. Because remember, at that time, we have more than 100 languages spoken throughout the islands. So it's more systematic. Indigenous. Yeah, because one of the requirements is to learn the language of the natives. You cannot evangelize without learning the, the language. The lang communication was very important. And the rule was learn the language of the natives. Not That's to impose important. the Spanish language, rather. They did not impose. It's if you're one missionary for one whole area, you cannot do that. So what they did, they learned the language of the natives, and those who would not learn Spanish, they, you know, on a limited area only, like in cities in bigger towns, or the pueblos, or the cabetera. But in the remote mission areas, and before you can become a parish priest, you should master the, at least two languages. You cannot become a parish priest without first speaking the language of the people of whom you are uh, to, um, to serve. So, yun po importante. Kaya, kaya nga, ang tradisyon, no, the tradition of each town was maintained because of continuous learning of the language of the missionaries. They learned from the people. And that's why they were, we were able to compose dictionaries and grammar books and even compose novenas and translate catechisms in the languages of the people whom we are served, whom we were serving at that time. So remember, in evangelization, communication was vital. Without learning the language, how can you evangelize effectively? It's interesting though, Pona, it was Philip II who ordered it. So at that time, um, he was also uh, giving orders to the to the to the religious uh, parang yes. walang separation of church and state or at that time there was no separation of church and state the system was called in the patronatorial or the royal patronage where the holy father from alexander the sixth to julius the second granted we might say uh we might say um privileges to the king of spain to supervise the missions mm. because he is the patron of the mission he is the one to finance and to support the missionaries. That's why whenever they, the missionaries he assigned would go to the Philippines or to any of the colonies, he would be the one to pay for their fare and their needs. Mm -hmm. In return, he has the right to supervise the missions through his representatives, the, gover the governor general and the archbishop of Manila, especially the governor. Okay. That's why there was no separation of church and state. And the final word would also come from the monarch, not from the arch. The bishops of Cebu, the bishop of Nueva Segovia, would, and archbishop would only prepare the, the initial state of parish, parish, uh, parish, we might say, establishment. But 
the final say would come from the king by giving the royal decree. The royal decree officializes the establishment of the parish, not the bishop, but the Spanish monarch. That's why so, when I was, I was teaching my students, if you want to establish the date of your parish, look for the royal decree because that is the definitive decree of the birth of your parish, not the decree of the archbishop of separating your parish for your, your chapel from the mother parish. It's only a, uh, we might say, preparatory stage. But the final stage was the royal decree coming from the Spanish monarch. Up to 1898 is how we look at the royal Yes. The, the last, the, the, when we, we were only ceded to the American government on December 10, 1898, in the Treaty of Paris. That ceases the patronato real and come and came the separation of church and state when the Americans took over the Philippines. That was the date, December 10, 1898, in the Treaty of Paris. So, well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, interested ako how, what was the collaboration or in relationship ng mga missionaries with the king or with the representatives of the king? Uh, in the well, islands, uh, well, it depends or... on the situation. Now, there are sometimes uh, tumultuous, sometimes amiable. But they have to collaborate because remember, the, he was the representative of the king. But whenever there would be a conflict between the Archbishop of Manila and the Governor General, the religious would always side with the Archbishop of Manila and have them settled among themselves. Because the, the, the Patronato Regio or the Patronato Real has a complex uh, relationship between the Archbishop and the Governor. Because both of them were representatives of the King. Mm -hmm. And they have to eye each other in order to avoid abuses. That's why the final decision would always be on the part of the King. So they will write a petition, complain, and the response will come a year later. Who would, side, who would be cited? The Archbishop or the Governor? by the king of Spain. So that's a complex situation at that time. So that's the why that was, that was a valid one. To the governor valid general. One. Direct siya to the king. Yes. Kung ano mang, there would be complaints. They would always write a report and complain to the king and the king would respond. The same thing with the governor. He would, he would complain against the archbishop. The king would respond. So it is the king. The king of Spain was the arbiter. No, so do they go first to the, do they report both to the king and to the no, pope? No, the pope did not enter here. The pope has no jurisdiction in the Philippines. As I said, the Patronato Real ended on December 10, 1898. It was then that the Vatican came in by sending its first apostolic delegate, no? Placid Lashap, Archbishop Placid Lashap, only in 1898. Oh. The pope had no jurisdiction. The jurisdiction only the king that's why one of the privileges of the king the pope cannot enter without his permission that's why he has to go oh to the king God. to his nuncio in madrid for consultation so the pope had no direct contact with the philippines at that time only to the nuncio in madrid so the first direct contact was only 1898 when the patronato real ended when we were ceded by spain to the United States. So if there were um, priests or friars who were misbehaving then, magsusumbong po sila or they would report it to the king and no, not to first, the No, first, it has to go first to the, to the governor general and to the archbishop and to the prior provincial of his religious order. No? So this, the, internal, the internal problems were, were you know, settled by Three important personages, the prior provincial of whom the religious belong to, to what religious order, to the Archbishop of Manila, and the Governor General. So these are the three personages who would discipline the religious whenever they misbehave. So there are this the in, internal problems were set up among these three, not the King of Spain. The king is, is more on administrative and this is between the, the Archbishop of Manila and the Governor General of the Philippines. Okay. Balik po tayo sa Recollects. So when they arrived in the 1600s, um, and then of course they found they founded their own their own um, homes and then uh, went to the Zambales. Uh, what was the first legacy 
po of the recollects? Uh, did they build a church or a school? Well, it's not just building a church. The church came later. No, the foundation of the missions, which is more important, because remember, settlements were scattered, and in order to organize a bigger settlement, they have to uh, ask them to come down, you no, know, from the mountains or from the hills, you know, on a certain plain where they organize them in communities. We call it the reduction, the reduction of the natives into the reduction is the mission settlement where. The missionaries allotted a, a, a parcel of land to the natives and they built their first missions they called Reduction. And at the center is a chapel and where they could uh, have the uh, instruction. And after the instruction and after so many years, the baptism and what we call the preparation for the reception of the sacraments. Once that the mission became a barrio, a barrio became a town, it would become a later on a parish. So these are stages, no? Because you cannot evangelize remote areas with two families in that mountain, three families on this side of the mountain. You have to gather them into settlements, which we call the reduction settlements, you know? Which would be the embryonic stage of the town of the of today and the parishes. So that was the thing that, that they did based on the 1587 Synod of Manila uh, that was uh, uh, held. No, in Manila, uh, by the first bishop of Manila, Domingo de Salazar. So the reduction was approved, and the teaching through the reduction was a method applied by the missionaries, including by the recollects. So what do you see? The basic reduction: the houses, the market. At the center is the plaza, the market, the parish church, and the parochial school. When we discussed focus with the other orders, they shared with us that they had created hospitals, um, the first book, Doctrina Christiana. So for the recollects, what were the um, uh, con contributions for when they arrived in the 1600s? Okay, so our contributions were more on pastoral. That's why Nick Joaquin dubbed us as the pastors of the Philippine missions. Now remember, uh, in uh, since um, we might say since uh, from 1606 to 1896, you know, the recollects were we were carrying at, at that time 1,249,399 souls in 203 towns in 20 provinces throughout the Philippines. And our contribution was uh, community building that is self-sustaining. For example, classic example we were given the poorest parishes. And one of them was Las Piñas. It was created as a parish that nobody could accept it because nobody would like to take it because it was very poor and isolated from Sapote in the south and from Paranaque on the north because there was no bridge. They were separated by two rivers. So the recollects by the order of the Governor General accepted it and sent Padre Diego Serra. He was assigned in Mabalacat, Pampanga, and he was sent to Las Piñas as the first parish priest from 1795 to 1832. No? He built the present church and the famous bamboo organ. I was assigned there, Father, as a deacon. Oh, talaga. Maganda ng bamboo organ, no? Maganda. It was preserved by the, by the CICM, CICM fathers when they took over in 1975. So, Diego Cero was an Agustinian recollect pala, no? Yes. He was the first parish priest assigned there. He not only improved the economy by uh, uh, teaching them to improve the salt bed industry. Kasi ang tatay ko taga Las Piñas. Sa old, old word, ano, it's at uh, 20 meters at the back of the church. And kapag dadaan kami from Cavite, at that time wala pang uh, coastal road, doon kami tumulad sa, sa Las Piñas mismo. And you will see at that time, ang dami mga asina na di, di, ano, we call it salinas called rice uh, salt beds. So the purest. Yes. Salinas in Spanish called salt beds. He also improved the fishing in there and promoted the bamboo industry in Las Piñas to augment the income of the people. Kaya nga, whenever we establish a community, it should be self-sufficient. So the, aside from the parochial school, we have trade schools to teach the, the people the know how, how to earn a living with the purpose that they would support the parish priest and the church. That's why 
All our comedies at that time in the Spanish sub system, there was no doll out. There were no doll outs. So that's an example. No? The, the Bamboo Organ Church is still around today, diba? And up to today, they still have concerts, diba po? Yes, yes. The Bamboo Organ is, uh, was, made of, was made of the bamboos, no? Selected by Padre Diego Serra. They were buried for one year in the, in the, at the, in the, in the sand, in the sea. And later on, they were used no, in building the present bamboo organ in Las Piñas. So imagine from 18, 1795 to 1832, he died in our convent in San Sebastian, Manila. He was sick, but they, he did a lot for the people of Las Piñas. Then I we have another... Fascinating yes. that to this day, this, this bamboo organ that he built is still around and functioning and yes, yes. bringing because, out music. The CICM, the Belgian father, the CICM, was, were responsible for restoring the bamboo organ. So another one, in, let's go to Negros, for example. Bacolod City, its town, the city itself, was planned and, uh, and, uh, planned and uh, organized by a recollect missionary, Father Mauricio Ferrero. The cathedral, the Episcopal Palace, and uh, the the provincial jail, which was demolished in the 1990s, no, were built under his supervision when he was the parish priest of Bacolod City. Another one is uh, the famous uh, uh, recollect in Talisay City, no, that is uh, uh, several kilometers away from Bacolod, was Father Fernando Cuenca. He was the one who improved the sugar industry of Negros and introduced the hydraulic press for crushing sugar cane and introduced also the hydro hydrotherapy for curing illnesses in the Philippines. So the, those were wow. illustrious. So, so it's, ours is pastoral. We were not like the other, they are more, they have their own peculiar contribution. Ours is more pastoral because hands-on kami. Hands Parang on. community building. Community building actually. We live in community and we build communities. That's yeah. the thing that we are do we were doing at the time. Ano kayo napunta father sa Palawan? Yung Palawan mission. naman, uh, ano, we were assigned only in 16, uh, 16 uh, 22, and we arrived in 1623. We evangelized first the northern part of Palawan. We call we call Cuyo, the Calamianes Archipelago, no? Kasamang Kulyon at Gotaya and the mainland Taytay. In 1871, we were assigned, given the task to evangelize the southern part of Palapan and we opened Puerto Princesa. And in Puerto Princesa, uh, uh, the head of the mission there was St. Ezequiel Moreno. And he was uh, the one, uh, one of the founders of Puerto Princesa and extended his uh, interior evangelization of the natives of Palawan and the Tagbanwas of the southern part of, of Puerto Princesa. So, Ihawig po, di ba? Ihawig? I Iwahig. Iwahi. <laughs> Iwahi. That is Iwahi. south of Puerto Princesa. That's part of, uh, of the, uh, even up to Iwahi, up to Brooks Point. No? These were Agustinian recollect mission territories. No? When, when the prefecture of uh, Palawan was created in 1910, the propaganda fide, the propagation of the faith, entrusted the whole island to the recollects. That was definitely in 1910. But in, 19, uh, in the 1980s, we gave it up when we uh, gave it to the diocesan clergy because we founded the seminary and it's high time for the diocesan clergy to take over the former missions in Palawan. Uh, the, so the first diocesan bishop there was the late uh, Bishop San Diego. No? Mm -hmm. He was the first diocesan bishop of Puerto Princesa. Father, I'm interested po in St. Ezekiel Moreno because um, when my father had cancer, he was introduced to my dad by some Mindoreños. Yes. St. Ezekiel Moreno, actually he came here as a missionary and he was assigned, when he was ordained priest in 1871, his first assignment was in Calapan, Mindorio no? Oriental. And he was assigned in that pen, in Calapan, where his elder brother was parish priest. So he was assigned as, an, as a companion, compañero, in order to learn the Tagalog language. 
So he stayed a longer time in Mindoro in order to learn Tagalog because he will be assigned in the Tagalog provinces. So from Mindoro, he was transferred to Palawan and Palawan, he was transferred to, uh, we might say, Las Piñas. He became parish priest of Las Piñas for three years. From Las Piñas, Santo Tomas, Batangas, then back to Manila, then to Inus Cavite. So these are talag Tagalog speaking areas. So he spoke Tagalog aside from Spanish. And not only that, no, during the cholera epidemic in Cavite, he administered to the sick, no? Not, uh, not uh, we might say, uh, no, not fearing the dangers of the cholera epidemic, and he was able to anoint almost almost all people who were dying of cholera. Then in 1885 he was back to Spain. In 1888 he was he volunteered as a missionary in, in Colombia. He became bishop of Pasto, and he died of cancer in 1906. And because of that, no, he, he abandoned everything to Gaza he became the patron saint of cancer patients. And there are so many healings from God through his intercession. So that's it. I, I also read that he got malaria yeah. at some point. Yeah. Whenever you are a missionary in the Philippines, especially in Palawan, you have a, you have a mark that is malaria. Yes, malaria. Without malaria, you're not a missionary. <laughs> so he, that is the that that is scars. A branded brand, a brand a missionary brand. No, you, you got malaria. That's <laughs> okay. the thing that you have to know. Uh, that he he really got malaria in in Palawan. But if you notice, uh, in our geography, most of the towns were founded, established along the sea coasts, mm -hmm. not the interior, because they are avoiding malaria in the interior. And secondly, why the sea coast? Yes, the, the communication and travel is, was by sea, by boat. It was faster at that time. So that's why most of our mission uh, territories were founded near the sea coast. The sea Bisayas Malaga. region, yeah. Father, the Bisayas, San Kayo nag concentrate. Uh, in the Bisayas, no. Uh, first, we were in Cebu. No, we, we established our first community in Cebu in 1620. Then from Cebu. When the Jesuits were expelled from the Philippines, no, the Spanish crown told us to, to continue the works of the in Bohol. And Bohol, no, uh, sumunod na po yung ano, uh, 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 in the 1800s by in Cebu, we were, we were able to extend to 10, 10, ano, 10, uh, 10 ministries in northern of Cebu. And in 18, 1848, if my memory serves me right, the colonial government entrusted the, the whole island of Negros for, for systematic evangelization. No? Oriental, Occidental, and City Hall. Yeah. In Cebu naman, going to from, ano, from Mandawi up to what is now Camotes Island. No? So, we were, so we were extended. Because remember, as I said, the Philippines were divided among the four. We were left out. What were given to us, the things that they could not evangelize. So, ika nga eh, panakit butas. Pero effective. No? Mas effective pa sa Bulkasil. Ayan. Yeah. Tsaka yung legacy po ninyo hanggang ngayon. Talaga, I mean, imagine the bamboo organ. Of course. No? And no, do not forget, no, the efforts of the recollects in building the San Sebastian Basilica, the Old Steel Church. Can we talk about the San Sebastian Basilica? It's so beautiful, Father. The architecture and it's just enamoring. Yes, it's neo Gothic. It was uh, built, you know, pre pre fabricated in Belgium, and it was what I think by eight ships, you no know, containers, and it was reassembled in Manila. And the painting of the interior was done by Don Lorenzo Rocha, you know, the, I think the founder of the. UP uh, College of Fine Arts and his students decorated the interior. The six Philippines um, made the interior. And of course, what is was more important while the church was built, it is the shrine, the first Marian shrine of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. And that image arrived in 1618. It was enthroned mm -hmm. in San Sebastian Chapel at that time in 1621 of May 5. Ang Bakit shrine niya ng Mahal na Birhen? Bakit ang, ano, ang patron ay San Sebastian? That's common. Because uh, at first, 
when we were looking, that was in 1621, we were looking for a place for a uh, house of retreat. Our benefactor, Don Bernardo Castillo, who was in charge of Fort Santiago, gave us his ano, rest house of what is now where the San Sebastian Church. That was his, 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 ano, his, his uh, we might say, uh, land. No? He donated the land, provided in the agreement, never changed the patron of the chapel. San Sebastian, because that was the patron of the benefactor. He was a soldier, and San Sebastian was uh, was the was the patron saint of soldiers. So we maintained that agreement. So the patron saint of the chapel and of the church right now is still San Sebastian. However, when the Carmel image arrived, it became also her shrine. That was the secondary patroness or the Mary Marian patroness of the church, which we we have also that the tradition. Whenever there is a primary patron, the secondary patron is always me, is always Maria. The Recollects and the Black Nazarene. Okay, the Black Nazarene was brought. Kasi I was researching. Our chroniclers were, I know, were, I know, were silent. They could not find the exact date. But the Confradia de Jesus Nazareno, the confraternity, was established in San Sebastian. The Arch Confraternity. In 1650, approved by the Pope. So before 1650, and Jana Imahen. Pero what date we do not know. According to our resources, there were two images which were brought from Mexico. No? And remember, it's made of Mexican wood. Ang Mexican wood, a type of which I do not know, pag nagtatagan, umiitin. Parang kamagong sa Pilipinas. So hindi ho nasunog yan. It's a type of wood. Yes, hindi ho nasunog yan. There's a type of wood in Mexico which was used for uh, making images like Our Lady of Antipolo. Ganyan. Pag tumatagal, it's, you know, it's, it's uh, becoming darker. The same thing with the, with the Nazareno. That's why we brought two images. One is at the main altar and the one that is was bring, brought out for procession. At that time, on procession, before the 1800s, Holy Monday, by the confraternity. But later on, it was transferred to uh, Palm Sunday. So it is only brought only once every, once a year, every Palm Sunday since the 1800s. No? Ngayon, dumadami po ang devotion. So I'm just making a hypothesis because we don't have data. This is only a hypothesis, an uh, intellectual guess. Since we had two, we gave one to Kiapo to accommodate the devotees. Oh. That's why the famous, it was January of 17 something, I do not know exactly. The translation, the transfer was made from Intramuros to the Recollect Church to Kiapo, January 9. That was the traditional date. I'm just making a hypothesis. No? Unfortunately, during World War II, the ori one of the original image was burnt because our church was bombed. And the, and the image which we gave to Tiapo is still there. So it's providential. The translation was being commemorated every January 9. That was according to the traditional date of the transfer. Translation means transfer from our church in Intramuros to Tiapo Church. And then some people say that it's black because of um, enculturation. Uh, that's not yung wood, true. Yung wood pala. <laughs> yung wood lang ho. Hmm. Eh, para bang kamagong sa Pilipinas, pag tumatagay, umiitin yan. The same thing that wood that is common in Mexico. Final question, Father. Um, in the 500 years of Christianity celebration, uh, merong mga controversy about uh, the first mass and all that. Can you talk to us about uh, what's the status or uh, ano po ba ang resolution ng issue na about which is the first mass or how do we celebrate the 500 years of Christianity? Yung hmm. First, the 500 years is not evangelization. The 500 years was just initial contact. The arrival of Christianity because of the mass that was celebrated in Limasawa and the baptism that was administered in Cebu. First contact. Evangelization, which is systematic, began in 1565 with the arrival of Legacy 33 years after the death of Magellan. Okay, now. And the arrival of the Augustinians. Yes, the, the Augustine, the order of St. Augustine. Now, 
uh, this 500 years of the arrival of Christianity uh, would be you know, would be uh, celebrated jointly no by the uh, this uh, spearheaded by the National Historical Commission of the Philippines headed by chairman Dr. Rene Escalante and also the CBCP will have its uh, celebration also no and the Augustinians of Cebu because remember when Magellan came he brought with him the image of the Senor Santo Niño. Okay. Uh, the controversy was the first Mass, Easter Sunday Mass. No? Now, many believe it was in Butuan. Okay. Who was the culprit who, who uh, said it was but two Jesuit uh, chroniclers or historians? Culprit Padre Colin, like Padre Combes. Sinabi nila Butuan. They copied it from somewhere, I think the Remusio Chronicle, no, the history. And it was mentioned Butuan, Masawa Butuan. So for, from that time, that was in the 1600s until 1896 or 1898 when they discovered the, the Chronicle of Antonio Pigafetta in the Ambrosiana Library in Italy. And nakalagay doon. Documentarian. Yes. No? Li Masawa. So imagine for almost 300 years, the belief was butuan. When uh, uh, the Padre, uh, Father uh, um, Pastels, Pablo Pastels, wrote the correction, and many wrote the correction, many were already opposing it. Kaya nga nagkaroon ng controversy. When the Lima Sawa proponents now using the, the Francisco de Albo logbook of the navigation and the Chronicle of Pigafetta, these are the first sources, it was proven it was in Dimasawa. So in the 60s up to the present 1990s, no, it was always Dimasawa. But the Butuan proponents still were, were, have been fighting it should be in Butuan. Well, um, after so many presentations on the side of the Butuan proponents and of the Dimasawa using their, we examined their sources, still the sources is still paid for is Antonio Pigafetta. And Limasawa, up to now, that's last July 20, I think July of 2020, the National Historical Commission still declared that Limasawa is still the site of the first Easter Sunday Mass. So conclusion, it's really Limasawa. Limasawa. For the I, record. I, yeah, for the record, because remember, history is not dogmatic. History, we don't talk about just the truth. We, we have to, before you, you, Talk about the truth, you have to examine the facts. The truth is that the first mass was celebrated. Where? Examine the facts. Butuan or Limasawa. The facts could only be examined through historical documents that are authenticated. Without documents, you cannot prove your point. That's why without so documents, you just make a hypothesis without the proof of document that is contextualized, no? It's just a pretext. A text without its proper context is just a pretext. That's why you have to examine to the, the all this document, Pigafetta's Chronicle and Albo's Logbook of Navigation. And remember, the computation at that time was very primitive. That's why you have to be careful. No? So after so many debates, still, the Masawa was uh, uh, still, is still the, the, you know, the most probable most probable site of the first Easter Sunday Mass based on historical facts. <laughs> Father, if it's considered Easter Sunday Mass, do we celebrate it on the Sunday or is there a specific date that we... Sunday recognize? talaga. Nakalagay doon, no? Domingo de Pascua. Easter Sunday. It was Sunday actually. No? According to Pigapetas Chronicle, no? it was said, Domingo de Pascua, Easter yeah. Sunday, according to their date, March 31, 1521. That's according to their calendar. Okay? So that's it, no? So you have to check the facts. The oldest documents is nearer to the truth. And that those, those documents should be first authenticated. And they were authenticated. Okay. Yeah. So, Father Jason, any last question or last words? <laughs> Very interesting, Father. But of course, in the 500 YOC, 
we celebrate the baptism, no? Not the first mass. Yeah, the uh, emphasis just... is the baptism because the first Christ, Filipino Christians who were Cebuanos, no? Uh, in the tribe of King Humabon of Cebu, who himself baptized together with his uh, queen, Reina Juan. And Reina Juan received a gift from Magellan as a ninong, as a godparent, the image of the Santo Niño. So the emphasis were on the baptism, no? the first Christians. A oh, father, last question. In these 500 years, what's the greatest gift that we received? What's, what is the one grand thing that we should celebrate? Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the Holy Spirit. Without these two, the three Holy Trinity, actually, God is the gift, the greatest gift that the missionaries gave us. The first Mass, Christ, the baptism, the Holy Spirit. No? These are the two important presents no? in, in, our, in our celebration. We should not, we should not, you know, the, the question is, yes, we know that there is God. The question, is He relevant today? The question of relevance is very important because many of us, we are only Christians by name or Catholic by name, but we are not Catholic by fact, by actions. We are only Christians by convenience. Or seasonal Christians. We need a, a, a Christian that is a living one who could witness Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit by the way we should live. Because for us, God should be relevant all throughout our lives. No? Kasi po nangyayari, we only approach God pag may problema tayo. We only approach God when we are sick, when we need something. But God, like air, is essential. Without God, we cannot survive. And that's the challenge of the new evangelization, how to make God relevant in our Philippine society today. Relevance. If faith seeks understanding in the Middle Ages, today, faith seeks relevance. How are we going to do it? It's up to us. It's up to you, Father Jason. <laughs> no, up to us. Up to Office us. of New Evangelization. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, it's Father uh, Emil. So enriching for us and for our uh, viewers and followers. Yes. Uh, you know, I have been missing teaching right now, right now because it's online. So I, I'm, I'm eager to share. Since that's the passion. I'm a teacher, not an oh. administrator. We're so Obviously. honored to have you and to listen to you, fathers. Thank you so, so, so much, Paul, for sharing your wisdom and your knowledge and all this information with us about church history and about the Augustinian Recollects. Sure. So thank you so much, Paul. So thank you, everyone, for watching. God bless.